Good evening. Welcome once again to another Anupale program. Thank you for joining me. This evening, we are talking sports, and we have quite a packed program lined up for you. But before we get into what is sure to be a very interesting discussion, I just want to update you on some of our activities this past week. On Monday, I met with Dr. Robert Floyd, Executive Secretary of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. This is a UN-affiliated body which focuses on the prevention of nuclear proliferation across the world and promotes the disarmament uh, for the safety and security of all. The treaty prohibits nuclear explosions for both military and civilian purposes. Dominica has always been and has always taken a stance against the proliferation of nuclear weapons. And so I welcome the opportunity to discuss with Dr. Floyd how we can continue to play our part in this regard. I am very pleased to announce that Dominica has given the commitment that we will sign the CTBT and become a full partner in efforts to strengthen the organization's work against nuclear testing. On Thursday, I toured parts of the Grand Bay constituency with the parliamentary representative, Honorable Dr. Vince Henderson, to observe a number of projects on the way there. In the Tetmon Mountain area, I was gratified to meet with a number of constituents to give them the assurance that government will address their housing needs. Even while we move ahead with new housing developments in various communities, there are those in our communities who are in need of immediate assistance to repair and in some cases rebuild their homes. Government will make the necessary arrangements to help a number of families in the Grand Bay area and make similar interventions in other parts of the island to the extent that the funds are available to do so in this financial year. Other projects in the Grand Bay area are progressing very well. We stopped at the Geneva playing field, which is an important project, not only for Grand Bay, but for the country at large. Geneva has always been a hotspot for Premier Division football and other competitive sporting activity. Following the damage caused to the field by both Tropical Storm Erica and Hurricane Maria, we are on track with bringing this facility back to standard. The finishing torches, including the grassing, will be completed shortly, and I look forward to the many games which will be played there very soon. The Makaton, Mopo farm access roads have long been a priority project for the farmers of Granby. With funding from the European Development Fund, we are currently undertaking an extensive road project in the area, costing approximately EC $1.5 million, which is expected to significantly enhance agricultural production. This is part of a larger initiative by this government to boost agriculture and productivity in agriculture around the island through investment in a number of farm access road projects. And just to say that there are some works already ongoing at the Mopo area financed by the government. And the other, ar other areas in the country um, include the Agricultural Station Road in Lapland, uh, Formi in Cassibrus, Bopla Road in Pebush, uh, Middle Region in Kalibishi, and a farm access road in Wesley. Contracts have been approved for all of these very important bitter roads. I thank the Office of National Foraging Officer Ms. Roberts here for facilitating this partnership and for her dedicated effort in this regard. The visit to Grand Bay ended on a high note with the signing of a contract for the construction of the first phase of the Bala Park Cemetery or the Chateau Road in Grand Bay. A local contractor from Grand Bay has been awarded the contract of over $107,000 for the project, which has been executed through the Grand Bay Village Council. And how I am so happy for the people there. As I've said before, I intend to continue these visits to various communities to view firsthand the projects being undertaken by this government to assess the respond and respond to the needs of the population and to determine how best to serve you, the citizens of Dominica. We remain committed always to the betterment of your lives in this country. 
On today's program, we are talking sports development, plans for the resumption of sports in Dominica amid the COVID-19 pandemic and the regional netball tournament, which officially gets underway this weekend. I've invited the sports coordinator, Mr. Trevor Schillingford, to give us some insight into the work that is being done within the sector and Her Excellency Lauren Bannis Roberts, Special Envoy for Netball, who will chat with us about the potential for the sport of netball here in Dominica. Later on, I will speak with three sports administrators to get their views on how we can improve sports in Dominica. Let's get right into it. Trevor, Ambassador Roberts, good evening, and of course, welcome to Anupali. Um, Trevor, how have you been? Well, been good. We have a good evening to um, the viewers, and um, thank you for the invitation to be on this program. Um, I've been good, trying my best to remain safe um, despite the, the um, various uncertainties that we have out there in terms of the various public health issues. But I'm trying my very best to remain as safe as possible. So that's the, yeah. Madam Ambassador, you, you have been in the element for the last few days. <laughs> Uh, with, Very much with, so. With excitement. No sleep, but yeah, no sleep. It's, it's because of excitement, Excited. not worry. <laughs> yeah, excellent. So thank you, PM, for inviting me to this program this evening. And it is certainly a pleasure to be here. Yeah, next time you go shopping in New York, you could buy me a nice outfit like this, you know. Okay. Yeah, I'll sure. definitely do uh, that. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you. Since, since 2020 uh, and, and the start of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, sports has been on a go slow. Um, however, government has continued uh, its work in developing the sector. First, what is your assessment of the impact of the pandemic on the sporting sector, Trevor? Yes. Um, um, if we were to consider um, sports by its very nature, mm -hmm. it is really um, contact in nature. And um, we are faced with um, the pandemic, which um, is um, caused by a virus, really, that is um, transmitted through human contact. And given the nature of sport, um, one could well understand um, the decision for really having place restriction on sporting activities, since sport in itself would can serve as a vehicle that would really um, cause the transmission of the um, virus. And um, that particular sector, like most other sectors, would have been affected, and even more so than other sectors, um, given the nature of sport, as I said earlier. And um, we, can sim we can safely see that um, sport have been negatively impacted by the COVID virus um, or the, the pandemic. Um, we saw a halt to most of the sporting activities that were being held. Even locally, we were really on, on a high in terms of the various um, national competitions that we had going on at the time when we had to take that decision to put restrictions on sporting activities. So that would have affected um, the programs of our national associations and also um, the activities of the Ministry of Sports. Um, Generally, um, citizens use the various sporting activities as a form of recreation. And the restrictions that were placed would have affected the recreational part of our citizens, which um, indirectly can also result to um, health issues. And um, that is one other area that um, we could have, we saw a negative impact. Um, also, in terms of um, our athletes preparing for the various sporting engagements, that would have affected um, the development of their skills, um, since they were not able to go out on the field to really um, put into practice um, some of the various skill development um, um, measures that would have to take place. And um, on the economic side, um, we know that there are several persons who would um, depend on sporting activities to earn a living, um, be it an elite athlete, or um, even those who are involved in sports business. And um, that would also affect um, that aspect of it. Um, the next major impact that we can see is um, the increased um, cost 
that it has really brought onto um, the various um, international sporting bodies. Because to have sporting activities now, they would have to be done in what we refer to as a barber. And one can well imagine the high cost of having this type of barbers. Um, take, for instance, um, in the past, you would have the national team traveling to, um, to partake in a sporting uh, activity. And um, players would assemble one day before and travel out of Dominica. But right now, you would have to get them into a sort of a barber before traveling almost an entire week before. That would um, impact negatively on the financing of the various sporting associations. So we can definitely see that the um, pandemic has really negatively affected um, the sporting sector. No, I, I hear all of this though, um, all very critical points, but how important is it for us to, to be able to resume to sporting activities in schools? Um, and, and what would the sports division need uh, in place uh, to consider the resumption of sports for students and maybe indeed the entire public? Well, um, the sports, um, physical education and sports at schools um, were really placed as part of the curriculum for, for a reason. And um, one of the main reasons being is that um, we know that the education system, a lot of the engagement of the students is done in a um, sitting position where they are in a stable position. And um, one of the reasons for having sports and physical education as part of the curriculum is to get the students active. Now, we all know um, there's a correlation between um, physical activity and the, the um, mental side of things. And um, there are several research that can be, um, that would reflect the um, type of impact that um, participation in sporting activities, in physical activities, can have on the academic side of the students. So that is important that the students would engage in such activities so that they can develop that mental side of things so that you now have a more holistic um, um, student. Um, there are other benefits like the various life skills that participation in sporting activities would bring to our students. Um, areas such as self-esteem, development of confidence, um, discipline, teamwork, um, time management, all of these factors uh, things that would really um, be to the benefit or sports can indirectly um, bring as benefits to the development of a student. Um, there's also the aspect of um, participation in sports at the youth level creates that type of pathway for our student athletes to um, move on to the elite stage. And um, with participation at the schools, they can now um, develop their skills, enhance their skills that would allow them to become the type of elite athletes that they would want to be in the various sporting disciplines. Now we can also um, look at um, the area of career paths. Um, sport has proven to be a major career path for a number of student athletes. And I'm even right within our own country, we can point to a few of our student athletes who have gone on to build a um, real careers in sports. We can pick up persons like Shane Shillingford, um, someone like Liam um, Kavim Hodge, who is today captain of the Windward Vulcan, or that is a professional cricketer, is actually earning a career out of that. And all of these are examples of student athletes who, who actually started sport at the school level. So we definitely, there is a need for um, we getting back to sport at the schools. And um, some of the things that we think that we we should put in place, and we have already done some of it. Um, we would have to provide a set of guidelines because we have to be cognizant that we are still operating within the COVID environment. And there would be need for us to establish some guidelines that would ensure the safety of our student athletes. Um, there would also be need for um, discussions with the Ministry of Education. That um, process we have already started. Um, but one other key area would have to be the issue of education. And um, we believe that we can use the various sporting activities within the school to educate our student athletes as to some of the safety measures that they would have to take. Um, they also need to understand the, um, the business that they're involved in, and that is sport, which is contact in nature. And since it is contact in nature, there is an element of risk in terms of um, 
the transmission of the um, um, coronavirus. And um, we definitely would need to educate the students um, that if they are to continue participating in the various sporting activities, there would definitely be the need for protection. And we would need to have that extra layer of protection, which would be the um, issue of vaccination. So we definitely would have to en engage our student athletes on the issues of vaccination. So, in, as I said earlier, government uh, has invested in, in several sports-related projects uh, since the start of the pandemic. Uh, can you take us through some of the work uh, which has been done over the past two years? Uh, and of course, some of them are ongoing. Yes, um, definitely. Um, the government of Dominica, um, through the Ministry of Sports and other agencies, um, have engaged in um, a number of um, infrastructural projects um, during the last two years. And um, these are happening at the time when we have the down period and um, it is very significant um, because what this will create is that um, when we have a full return of sporting activities our athletes will now be engaged in um, better facilities that would really enhance their skill development and um, we can speak of several interventions that have taken place over the last few years um couple years and we can speak here of the massac indoor facility um, that project is um, the continuation of that project um, took place over the last two years. And um, that project is basically completed. Um, we recently had, um, some up to last week, um, we recently had the installation of some heat extra ex extractors. And um, we had some, the procurement of um, some industrial funds that would ensure a, more, a cooler environment um, within um, the facility. Um, what is left to be done, it's really the electrification of the um, facility where it would be connected to the main Domlek supply. And um, that um, should put us in a position where we should be able to have the um, facility commissioned and for full activities to be taking place there. Um, now, um, people would drive by and they would notice that there's a shell there, but there are a lot of activities which have actually taken place within that shell. and. Um, one of the significant things that was done in there is the installation of a synthetic flooring. And um, that flooring is marked for the various sporting disciplines, netball, basketball, volleyball. And um, that had to be placed on a concrete slab that was, uh, that was totally redone. Um, we also have in the um, state of the art um, um, uprights, for instance, for the basketball, if you go in there, what you'd probably realize is that we have the same type of um, facility that you'd probably see on television during the NBA. Um, the same exists for netball and volleyball. Um, also in there, we have um, the aluminum bleachers um, that are movable and um, which would also create the opportunity that if the facility is to be used for some other reasons, that you could simply move all of the bleachers and have a facility that can be transformed for some other activity. Um, the construction of change rooms, there are change rooms for two teams in there with washrooms in, as part of the change rooms. And we also have the public um, washrooms for male and female that are also part of the facility. So it is not just a shell, but a lot of activity has actually taken place in there. And um, additionally, um, there is an outdoor cut that has been added to the facility. So that in itself will encourage a lot more participation in sporting activities. While activities are going on the inside, there's also the opportunity for others to engage in sporting activities on the outside. And, that, and the work on that facility um, cost in the region of $3 million. Um, um, we also have the rehabilitation of um, works at the Windsor Park Stadium, where we have seen um, repairs to the Players' Pavilion and Media Center. I mean, we all know that um, the stadium was um, heavily impacted by Hurricane Maria, and um, several interventions had to take place there. And um, the repairs to the Players' Pavilion and Media Center, um, the complete upgrade of the outfield, um, which involved sanding and regrassing, and also there was a period of about a year of lawn maintenance um, to ensure that we had a proper um, lawn at the um, stadium. Um, we also saw the fabrication 
of the um, support um, mechanism for the installation of the electronic scoreboard. In 2017, um, we procure an electronic scoreboard from a supplier in New Zealand, which costs in the region of $1.2 million. And we were only able to use that scoreboard once. And soon after that activity, Hurricane Maria totally destroyed the scoreboard. So what was done is that a structure was created for the installation of that scoreboard. And that's in um, line with our building back better policy. So we ensured that we have a more resilient structure and that the scoreboard that we have procured would actually um, be safer. And um, I have listened and I've heard people making mention that we do not have a scoreboard at the stadium. And that's probably one of the reasons why we are not getting international matches. That can be further from the truth. We actually have an electronic scoreboard at the stadium which was procured from a New Zealand supplier at the cost of $942,000. And that scoreboard is presently in storage at the stadium, and it has been for a number of months now. Um, the reason that we do not have this scoreboard um, on site is because the supplier has indicated his willingness to be on island to install this scoreboard. And um, that supplier having to come from New Zealand, and we know of the various travel restrictions that were placed by these governments, it made it a bit difficult for the supplier to be in Dominica to actually install. But he has given the assurance that if there is an urgent need, that there are some partners in Dominica who can really install that scoreboard um, on his behalf. We also have the procurement of new PA, PA system, tri-vision screens and, and security television system. Um, we also had the total rewiring of the media center um, all of these activities took place at the Windsor Park Stadium over the last two years, and that was in the region of um, $1.8 million. Um, um, rehabilitation of the playing field at Woodford Hill and the construction of a pavilion there. Um, that playing field was totally rehabilitated um, to include subsurface drainage. So we now have a surface at Woodford Hill that would probably dry out in about um, an hour, half an hour to an hour if there's a heavy downpour because of the type of sophisticated drainage system that was placed in there. And um, that, along with the pavilion, cost in the region of $978,000. Um, we had the rehabilitation of the Geneva playing field that is ongoing. You made mention of it a bit earlier. And um, that project is there in completion, almost 90% complete, with the grassing and perimeter drainage and the car park and all of these things um, to be done. Now that um, cost in the region of $500,000. And we also had as part of that project, a contribution from FIFA, which went into the um, preparation of the drainage system um, on the football playing area. We can speak of the uh, Mont Prosper um, basketball court, which was rehabilitated to the tune of $200,000. We have work started at the Collio playing field um, that is ongoing. That is one that is incomplete and we have to probably give some attention. We also have the development of the um, forecourt at the stadium, which costs in the region of $1.2 million. And um, we can well see the benefits of that particular forecourt as um, we will be having over the next week or so um, the OECS netball tournament, which will take place at that particular facility. Um, recently, we had the fencing of the Lindo Park in Goodwill, which cost about $70,000. Um, also, we had some fencing done at the Laplin playing field, which cost in the region of $85,000. So those were among some of the major um, infrastructural projects that we had over the last two years. There are a few others, um, such as the upgrade or the construction of hard courts at Penville and Vickers. Um, that I know PM would be happy to, 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 to hear of. And there are several other interventions that have taken place over the last two years. Thank you very much, Trevor. So, Ambassador, um, you know, we could, there are many things we can talk about um, with regards to your work at the United Nations. But, but today we're here to talk about um, sports and, and, and netball in, in particular. Um, well, Trevor has told us a lot about the ongoing development of the sector, the sporting sector. Uh, what are your views, though, about the progress we have made specifically with netball and, and the potential for the sport of netball in Dominica. Thank you, PM. Um, netball is a game that is played by over 80 million women and girls around the world. 
the potential for netball in Dominica is huge. Fortunately for us, we have a government in place that understands what the sport of netball means to all women and girls in Dominica. The world netball ranks 80 countries in the world. Dominica is at number 38. Now, the estimated value of sports as a major contributor to economic and social development is $756 billion annually. And I am very happy that, one, we have a new facility in the city. And because of that facility, we are having the international netball series taking place in Dominica from the 11th to the 19th of February, 2022. This is a major boost and a major platform for the women and girls of Dominica because we can use netball as a tool to achieve the sustainable development goals. Now, netball is no longer business as usual because there are so many opportunities as a netballer, and I promise to work with Trevor because the sports division is doing a very good job in the schools. The Netball Association must be ready to take it to the next level. So with COVID-19, we are at a pause, but it's a, it's a time to reassess and to plan the way forward. And if we think strategically, we can take advantage of the many opportunities, not only for netball, but for other sports. But we are at the drawing board stage, and the government must be commended for putting in place the infrastructure. My suggestion is that we reinforce the sports division, because they're already doing it, but we just need some reinforcement, and we go back to the primary school level. Once you get to the primary school level, the teachers, the coaches, the parents, the community must understand. So a decision must be taken at the top policy level to say, we are going to use sports as a tool to achieve the sustainable development goals. Because all of the 17 goals, sport plays a major component, or sport is a major component to achieve them. So if that decision is taken, coaches, athletes, parents, administrators must understand where we are going. The government will put everything in place, but if there's confusion as to where we are going and it's not clear, then we have a problem. No. Parents must understand and teachers that there is a future in playing the sport of netball and other games. In other words, take for example on a career D. You'll see the children with stethoscopes as doctors and the fire um, outfit and well you hardly see a cricketer. You hardly see a netballer because we have been trained to think that these traditional career careers is only what obtains. But here it is, if you go to UE's website, there are so many courses and degrees that you can achieve by playing the sport. So if we go to the primary school level and we speak with the teachers, the sports division, the sporting associations, there must be a parent's association of youth sports established. Because the parent must understand that your child who is gifted and talented must be happy at home. The nutrition, the encouragement, and I can say to you, I have a little story. I was walking in Casperos and I saw this mother roughing up her child. Where have you been? And you late? And where's your homework? And this, the child stayed back because he wanted to play football. But he's afraid to say, I will be late after school because I have to practice football. So she came down the road and she was roughing him up. I said, no, let him play. What you have to do is encourage him to have a schedule for homework and for play, a time for play. Now, guess what? She allowed him to play. 
he did well at school. And in fact, he won the Golden Boot. I think if you score the highest number of goals in the National League, there's a Golden Boot Award. And he got that. And every day, she thanks me because he made the National on the 23 team. So there is a good path in sports. We are all gifted and talented differently. We are not all born to be doctors. But the same level that the doctor achieved, the medical doctor, somebody pursuing a career path in sports can achieve this. So there is great potential for women and girls in netball, in sports in Dominica. And fortunately for us, we have a government in place that understands that and is putting the infrastructure in place. But we have to be committed and stay focused. So clearly, the, the, the new netball facility at the at the forecourt of the Windsor Park Sports Stadium um, has certainly provided a boost and um, reignited interest in, in the sport here. As a passionate uh, player and lover of the sport, certainly this must um, bring great joy to you. <laughs> Definitely. It's more than a boost and a shot in the arm. Actually, I mean, I played netball at the Windsor Park, and what obtains now is chalk and cheese. We now have free courts, lighted. And the passion is there. there is, you can see there was um, planning, proper planning taken into consideration in terms of establishing what we have now at the Windsor Park. We have to care for the facility. This is a proper outdoor facility for netball, for basketball, for volleyball, for tennis. And we have to do everything to protect and enhance what is there. And I want to commend the Member of Parliament for the Rosa Central constituency for her vision and her passion for sports in the city. She may be, yes, the parliament for the Rosa constituency, but this facility at the park is a national facility. Because when we play in the rural areas, we come down to town for the National League. It must be a proper facility to help us get acclimatized for when we travel to the region. No. The Winter Park Sports Stadium, because of the construction of that facility, we are today hosting the OECS ECCB International Netball Series. Now, it's not just a tournament. It's a series that is world ranking. The world, in fact, if you go on the world, the world netball website now, the weekly newsletter is on Dominica and this tournament. So can you imagine the reach that we already have so 80 million people who play netball and are interested in the sport of netball already know what is going to transpire at the Windsor Park Sports Stadium. And they are excited about it because it's the first major one during the pandemic, but we, I think we are at the tail end of it. Mm -hmm. You understand? So it was because we built the Windsor Park Sports Stadium and the Caribbean Netball Association saw what transpired at the opening of the National League in June that they offered to Dominica to host that tournament. Again, I want to thank you and your government because the Dominica Netball Association could not have given the nod to the CNA for this tournament without the involvement and the blessing of the government of Dominica. And in quick time, the government gave us the green light. We in turn transferred the information to CNA and today. Well, how do we... Netball is yeah. here. Well, Lauren, how do we build on that new interest in, in the sport among the young women in Dominica? And what are the systems we need to put in place uh, to advance netball in our country? Yes, we can. Mm. As I said, it has to take a collaborative effort. Mm. We have to, to, to get netballers interested, we have to go to the primary school level and the wider community. So we must put a system in place to get more netballers involved. Now, our principals and teachers must understand that netball or sport is not a break time thing. It is just as important as math, English, geography. Mm -hmm. And we have to nurture those. It's like a parent. From early, you know what your child is going to be or what sparks their interest. So once you have that, you get the children who are interested and make sure that the teachers, the coaches understand 
where we are going with this. Recently, I heard a story of an institution releasing the sports teacher because of COVID pandemic. This is the only teacher that got released because in their minds, sport is not being played. This is a major error. You have to use that time now to use the, and use the social platform to run your programs for your athletes. So the sports teacher should not have been released because the mental, the mental just, toughness of just, the athlete. Just to make it clear, this is, this is not a policy decision. So no, 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 so it's not. It's not. Been... it's not a policy decision. It's just the administration <laughs> yeah, of that yeah, institution that's that's that that's did that's not un does not understand the importance yeah. of sports and having a sports teacher at that time. Because even for us as DNA and CNA, together with the ECCB, we run a program, coaching program online. So you have to keep people together so that after COVID, we're moving forward. What I think we need to do, PM, is that we need a consultation and we need a policy decision or even part of the law, reinforcement. And I'm happy that the National Sports Council will take effect soon. So everybody must be clear where we are going. You have a consultation, and out of that consultation, you have a declaration. So every sporting organization must have in their office that declaration, which is a blueprint and a path to sports in Dominica, because we're going to use tool, um, sports as a tool for achieving the sustainable development goals, getting our athletes out there, making money, boosting our economy, tackling um, NCDs. And the thing is, with sports, it's from preschool all the way to your seniors. We need, we need to have clubs established. I played for the Celtic Sports Club. And when the netball team was playing, the footballers, and the cricketers would come support. So we need a club structure. Another thing we need is we need the same netball court with the lighting and the fencing in every district. So all players will have access to these facilities. In other words, in the north, south, east, and west should have that basic facility with proper courts, the proper size we, we may in fact, that it doesn't exist anymore, but we used to have players playing on a half court. That's not good. You need the full size in every district. Once it becomes affordable, then we do the northeast, the southeast, and that sort of thing. So when we organize district activities with the sports division, then all the players are exposed. We need washroom facilities. Yeah, excellent. Now, an important item on our agenda as a government is the construction of the indoor facility at um, Stock Farm. Um, we've had, you know, we've been making some changes to the designs um, based on the costings and so forth. Um, and, and of course, this is to facilitate netball um, and the other basketball, disciplines, basketball, swimming, uh, swimming um, tennis, volleyball, tennis. you know, and et cetera, et cetera. But this is something I am aware that you are super excited about. Super. Yeah. Super excited about this one because this will not only be a game changer, this will address so many of the issues confronting our sporting associations mm -hmm. as well as the country. Mm -hmm. Because it's going to be a facility that will bring major economic activity to Dominica. Mm -hmm. And now the time is right. And everything happens for a reason. Because had we constructed that facility at Stock Farm before COVID, there are many things now that we would have been components, we would have missed out on. With COVID, you have to go back to the drawing board and say, in addition to what I have, I need A, B, C, and D. Um, for that facility, in fact, somebody introduced me to, to a proposal where there's a machine that you use that can detect if the person has a fever. Mm -hmm. So everybody go for that scan. And this is something we should have at that facility. We need to add the accommodation component because our players must be in that bubble, COVID or not, at least a month before. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at what we have and see what needs to be added. 
there may be things in there that we no longer need or we may have to make adjustment to. So a small team must sit and say, these are the things we need in our facility. Mm -hmm. Now the facility, as I know it is going to be, is going to have parquet floors, it's indoors. Once you have that, you can attract international teams. You can bid to host, for example, the Commonwealth Games, mm -hmm. the AFNA qualifiers. Incidentally, the Dominica team should travel in November to Jamaica for the AFNA qualifiers. Once you get qualified there, you go to South Africa in 2023. So imagine the exposure for Dominica as a country. You understand? So you see, there's a lot of things netballers can look forward to. Mm -hmm. Once we have this facility in Stock Farm, it's going to be a game changer for Dominica. It's going to attract a lot of economic activity because even international teams, they want other places to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, they go to these other international countries all the time. They will come to the Caribbean, especially during the winter. They will come, they will play. So we have to get this facility going once we can do it. In fact, once you've made the announcement, I know it will be done. It may take a little while because there may be other challenges that we have to deal with, but that facility at Stock Farm, because it's not only netball, there are other sporting discipline, there's basketball. So, so we, we, we have to focus on this one to attract international teams to Dominica. Now, Dominica will host the second OECS ECCB netball tournament from February 13 to 19, that's correct? That's correct. Uh, how does a regional tournament of that nature benefit the players, the organizers, and of course Dominica as, as the host country? Uh, um, Ambassador and of course um, uh, Trevor can, can come in there and, and to indicate to us are all systems in place uh, for the successful uh, hosting the tournament. Well, PM, as we speak, um, we have already had some of the international coaches. They arrived yesterday. The president of the Caribbean Netball Association is here on Ireland, as well as the manager of the Barbados team. And I can tell you, the feeling for me is, is indescribable. One, there is need for play. Two, people want to see their regional friends. We have not seen each other for such a long time. We have not played for such a long time. And it's OECS, it's us in the region. But because we have gotten the blessing of World Netball, it's an international series. In fact, the World Netball has already asked me as of yesterday for the link because they need to promote what is going to happen here. So this is huge for us, it is big. And I do not want us to think it's just like a national league. In fact, all national leagues have moved to the next level. But this series, because of, in fact, the umpires, the umpires were selected by World Netball. And every evening, we are to report to World Netball, give them all the statistics because they are waiting on these results. So it cannot be taken lightly. And I want to thank the prime minister, cabinet, Mr. Trevor Shillingford, the Ministry of Tourism, the Ministry of Sports, and everybody, because it's a collaborative effort. And it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Because based on how we perform at this tournament, then it will be all systems go for Dominica for the hosting of other tournaments. Trevor, are, are all systems in place for the hosting? Well, yes, from, from the standpoint of the... Um, the, uh, um, the body responsible for um, ensuring that the facilities are in place. Um, I think we are at um, almost 100% in terms of um, the things that need to be done. Um, but um, one thing that is instructive to note PM, in that area is that um, our ability to transform what was considered to be a community facility to a facility to actually host an international event. And to do that, it had to take a lot of um, um, a huge expenditure from the government of Dominica. Um, because whereas we had the courts, but we did not have the other um, structures that would come with it to ensure that you can actually host an international event. For instance, um, the change rooms for the players, the um, change rooms for the umpires, the change rooms for the um, the medical um, personnel, and um, to have 
a sort of demarcation where you have players away from spectators. We also had to ensure that we set up proper washroom facilities for the spectators. And um, in terms of the lighting, um, we had to improve the level of lighting that we have. And um, we had to install some new um, LED floodlights, which really changed the whole environment of the place. So it really took a lot to transform what could be considered a community facility to a facility to host an international event. And I think that we were very successful at doing that. And it really took a lot from the government of Dominica, pretty close to um, $300,000 to really get um, that type of infrastructure in place to enable us to host. And I think we are at that stage now where um, we are all prepared um, just to have the um, first whistle go so that we can uh, truly move on with the games. So I can safely say that all systems are really in place for the hosting of the tournament. Chef, in, in one minute as we wind down, uh, can you tell us some of the immediate plans uh, and activities that the sports division has uh, now? once we can get the approval to resume sporting activities? Yes, um, firstly, we have been engaging, um, putting together um, a set of guidelines um, to really guide the reopening of sports. And that's one of the things that um, we were busily engaging. Um, and um, with the return of sports, um, we will be looking at some short um, tournaments that we want to do at the school's level that would probably generate interest among our um, young athletes. Mm -hmm. And one of the most immediate things that we are looking at is one, something that we call a schoolboys T20 cricket tournament. Yeah. And um, that will be done during the afternoon period in order to um, not affect the um, online learning that the students will be engaging during the morning period. And um, for that tournament, um, we are looking at um, actually providing the um, students with colored clothing um, to add a new dimension to um, 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 youth sports participation. So we are looking at providing each school with a kit of colored sure, uniforms sure. with their names and the numbers and all these things just to create that type of interest among our students. And we are also looking at doing a similar tournament um, in netball. Mm -hmm. And um, we are also looking at in track and field to move away from the um, usual track and field event but to do one that is specific to really activities only. So these are the three main activities that, we, that we're actually looking at in the immediate and um, that we intend to have all of these activities happening within a safe zone, which we would utilize the Windsor Park Stadium for all of these activities to ensure that our student athletes are safe during the um, pandemic. Oh, thank you very much. Lauren, any final words on on, on the tournament and of course to the, to the players and to our visitors coming in? Yes, um, I must say that so far, those who have arrived, they are very mm. pleased with um, the reception they received, their transportation, their facilities. Um, our players are ready. Um, they will look good and I want to thank in particular um, Samuel's Fish and Shrimp Rapid Security Corp. These are two companies based in New York, as well as the Palre for the Rosso Central Constituency, the Honorable Melissa Popon Skerritt, who leaves no stone unturned. She's a stickler for detail, like me. So she has ensured that our team will be looking very good, very professional um, when we step out there on the court. The, the mental prepared, they are prepared mentally, they are excited. And um, I expect us to do well and to give a good account of ourselves. The sport of netball, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, lose, but you have to win happily and lose graciously. So we expect our players to be on show. We will expect the facility at the stadium to come alive this weekend. And um, the world will be watching. The world will be tuned in. What an opportunity for the Nature Isle. And we have done it because we've partnered together. Excellent. At this well, thank time, you. I want to thank both of you, uh, Trevor and Lauren, mm -hmm. for being here. It, it's been a very useful engagement. There's so many more things no. I want to talk about, but because of time, you know, we could spend, you know, certainly three, four hours speaking about sports and, and all of the wonderful things happening in sports. Again, during this pandemic, you know, um, um, you know, to be talking about investments in sports, yeah. um, most countries will not prioritize this. Um, because resources are, are 
are difficult to come by. But we're committed here in Dominica to doing so. And I'm happy to have had you on to uh, articulate some of what is happening in Dominica where sports is concerned. Yes, Kim. Uh, and before I leave, because I'm a firm believer that sport is a tool to be used to achieve the sustainable development goals. I know you are aware of the SDGs. Of course, and yeah. in 2015, you gave the green light for Dominica to sign on. Yeah. But sometimes we just need to see it every day, have the SDGs. So I've decided to present to you with this um, ball. And interestingly, it's a ball, okay. sports, to be used as a tool to achieve, achieve the sustainable development goals. OK, great. Decent work and economic growth and zero hunger, climate yes. action, we're very strong on this. Yeah. Clean water and sanitation. That's you know. correct. Uh, um, so we, we, we're making great progress and reducing inequalities. That's right, you're giving women uh, a fair well, well, opportunity. Well, we may not take it over in Dominica. That's, that's right, the problem that's there, right. You know? that's so right. We, I think we stand up. We, we may not have to watch it there. <laughs> um, quality education. That's correct. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. On today's program, I will also engage three of our sports administrators uh, to speak of their plans for the resumption of sports in Dominica and general matters related to sports development in Dominica. I've invited Mr. Liam Sebastian, we not Island's Cricket Board Senior Panel Selector and the second Vice President of the Dominica Cricket Association, Mr. Glenn Etienne, President of the Dominica Football Association, and Mr. Peter Ricketts, the President of the Dominica Amateur Basketball Association, to chat with us this evening. Uh, gentlemen, uh, good evening and welcome to Anupali. Peter, we'll take you first. Good evening. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having, uh, having me on the show today. And I um, hope to shed some insight onto the needs of basketball um, as, it, as it pertains to the resumption of, of, of sports in Dominica. Excellent. Um, Glenn, Glenn welcome. Good evening. Yes, good evening, um, Honorable Prime Minister. Thank you for having me on the show to share some of um, the insights of football pertaining to the resumption of play. So thanks for having me. So excellent. And, and Liam, welcome. Yes, thank you very much, um, Prime Minister. Thanks for the opportunity for having me to be part of the show as we talk about the resumption of sports. Thank you. I just want to say to the to our audience that we are speaking with Liam Sebastian via Zoom, uh, who is joining us from Trinidad where the Winnot Islands volcanoes were locked in battle with Guyana over the past uh, few days. Um, certainly, uh, Liam was recently appointed manager of the Winnot Islands volcanoes. Uh, Liam, I, I said welcome to Onupale and congratulations also on your recent appointment to the Winnot Islands uh, Cricket Board as a selector. Um, you, know, you, you know, it's your real motivation for so many of us as young people. Um, how are your new duties going on so far? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister, for the contact with our messages. And um, thus far, the, the, the job has been going fine. Um, the, the team has been doing fairly well um, in terms of preparation and in the game that we are playing against Guyana. But um, as is anything in life, there are challenges that, that, that we have to overcome. And um, we will do our best as a group. But I just want to take this opportunity to thank the Honourable Minister Kojia Frederick and uh, my yes, Ms. Manager Fagan for the opportunity to, 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 to serve as a manager of the team and as a face yourself as a Prime Minister to support from the government in allowing me to take this opportunity. But excellent. I, I have been following and, and I wanted Afanas to score the century. Um, <laughs> please tell him this river swing, you know. <laughs> yeah. we, we have to stop that. <laughs> I, I will. I will communicate to the talent. Because that, that, that has gotten him out a few times in the past and denied him the hundreds, you know? <laughs> um, but from your perspective as a selector, what is the potential you are seeing among Dominican players uh, to advance and to do well uh, at the regional and international levels? I think we have a very large pool in terms of talent and the potential um, in Dominica players. I think we have always been blessed with talent. What I think um, is needed for our players to get to the next level is the nurturing of them to provide the resources that they can move from one step 
to a higher level because in terms of talent, I think that we are very rich in terms of talent that we just spoke about Alec. Um, we have other players like Kevin Hodge, um, Stefan Pascal, one of the other players, and a lot more that we can name, but the, the, the talent pool is very, very large. And I think what is needed from, you know, local administrators and the cricket association is just to provide the resources, the resources sorry, and the avenue for them to move from these talented players to almost the finished product. Now, how is the Dominica Cricket Association, of which you are part, uh, preparing our young cricketers to play at the professional level? That's a very good question, Mr. Prime Minister. And um, one of the, some of the things that we are doing at the Cricket Association, because we have been um, in, uh, doing a lot of planning, and uh, I'm planning from both for both male and female, and um, a lot of grassroots programs are being put in place. As we speak, we are developing a proposal for women under 19 to have programs that we can set for them to train. Also, um, the, we have the Cricket Academy, and I want to say please this opportunity to say much thanks to Mr. Emmanuel Manson, the chairman of the Academy Board, that we use as basically a hub for cricket that is used to train persons from under 15 right up to the senior level. We have also developed um, a program where we call Vision 2024, where we are preparing the under 19 cricketers to, to get ready for the next ICC Youth World Cup. So as we, as we speak, we recently concluded the World Cup just finished where India won. But we are looking to prepare our Dominican players for the next World Cup. And that, has, that is being done in conjunction with Cricket West Indies. So we're basically just putting a lot of plans in place for persons to have the opportunities to fly from where we are at one point to get them to the next level and be ready when they, they, they travel to other countries to represent the country. And, and based on your, your, your extensive experience in cricket, uh, both as a player and, of course, as an administrator. What is your assessment of the state of Dominica's cricket? And, and what do we need to do to grow the sport in Dominica? We, we, you spoke of the talent, but what, what, else, what else do we need to, to put in place here? I think, honestly, the state of cricket um, is not where we want it to be. There's a lot of room for improvement, if you ask me honestly. But... I believe a greater collaboration across the sporting disciplines and um, the different stakeholders will help and assist. And um, I just want to talk about the National Sports Council. I think that is a much needed avenue to develop cricket and also the other sports because it will provide just one blanket avenue so that all sports can be put on, have an equal opportunity because from the Cricket Association, it is very difficult from a financial standpoint to, to put in place some of the programs that we want to implement. But if there is such avenues such as the National Sports Council. The funding and us resources will be available for, for all disciplines to tap in, and then also the different disciplines can work together in advancing different sports. So I think one of the main things that, that, that can be done is the, the establishing of the Sports Council and also with a collaboration across sporting disciplines. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Now, Peter, uh, welcome again. Um, you were recently voted in as the president of the Dominica Amateur Basketball Association. Uh, this is not new to you, of course, in terms of sports administration and, and basketball. What are the plans this time around uh, to develop the sport in Dominica? Uh, <clears throat> thank you. So, uh, yes, you, I, I recently was uh, voted in as the president. And um, though it was a challenging time to take up that mantle with the additional challenges um, presented by COVID, uh, however, what um, I would like to, 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 to see done or what I'm going to try to do as president is, first of all, we're trying to have a, a retreat. Um, so we have submitted a, we're submitting a proposal to the Dominica Olympic Committee to get that funded uh, so that we can put together a strategic plan uh, to see how we can um, a, approach re the re introduction of basketball in Dominica, but not just in the same, uh, in the same manner. Um, but of course, with the with the new the new challenges of COVID, um, but also as well as implementing the various programs and having a pathway from the grassroots level all the way up, so athletes know what their next step would be and what they are looking what they're working towards. Excellent. Now, now you've been pushing the three x three version of the of the sport, and I understand you, an effort to prepare local players to play at the Olympic level. How is this going? And are all players showing promise 
in, in this regard? Yes, absolutely. So um, most persons may have known that we did qualify for the Pan Am Games in Cali, Colombia. Uh, unfortunately, because of some travel uh, difficulties, we got stuck in St. Lucia. But that team prepared for about three months in a bubble camp where all the players were vaccinated, um, all the, the, the personnel allowed in that area was vaccinated. So we had a nice bubble and we had no COVID incidents. But the training, we were able to track their metrics, so their shooting percentages and so on, and saw them develop over that short time span, with it, which is three mm -hmm. months. Um, now, because it's a smaller group, of course, we can have more focus. Um, we can give more attention to the athletes and have them develop quicker. So that's one of the benefits of 3x3 is that because you're using a, you, you have smaller teams, teams of four, one substitute and three active players, um, it's easier to get them to travel, so mm -hmm. to participate at regional and international tournaments. And then also, as long as we continue to host games, they are all tracked on the 3x3 platform, FIBA's official platform, and this will rank us up in points and get us qualified to participate at the Olympics. So our goal is to qualify for the 2024 um, Paris-France Olympics. Well, let us know how we can help in the government. Certainly, it's something we'd like to partner with the Basketball Association on. Absolutely. Uh, so please let us know what kind of support is required. Um, well, that's excellent, and let, uh, let's push it very hard. Now, um, Glenn Etienne, good evening again, and, and welcome um, to Anupali. How are things at the DFA? Good evening, Honorable Prime Minister. Okay, excellent. Uh, yeah, things at the DFA are slow on the field, which we expect to change soon. But we are very aggressive off the field. Mm -hmm. And given the current... Um, protocol well there is no play but a lot is being done on the back end to ensure the development of football on the island now now glenn is is football in dominica at the level it should be and and how is the dfa working uh to increase capacity uh for greater success at the regional and international tournaments? Well, like in all things, there's always room for improvement. Okay. Certainly. <laughs> we, have, we, we have to do the needful to improve our brand of football. We have to increase our level of competitiveness and to increase the number of people interested and actively playing the game. I think that way we can have a more engagement and even a larger football family. The DFA now, we are working to develop its capacity, both physically and human resources. Well, we continue to take on projects to develop our football infrastructure and procure equipment to facilitate play on various levels. Well, in terms of our human capacity, our association continues to take full grasp of all training opportunity that is available that we can use to develop our staff and we also provide training to club representatives mm -hmm. and to individuals who indicate their interest in our programs. We try to help them. Most recently, two of our staff members, our technical director, Mr. Jerome Badwill, and our national coach, Mr. Rajas Lachu, they both recently completed a B license course, and that's the first for Dominica. As we speak now, at present, our clubs are ongoing with a C license course with our technical director and our coach mentorship programs we have going on now in Dominica. So this is ongoing as we speak presently. Well, I want to congratulate the two gentlemen for, for this um, achievement. Uh, it's, it's good news for football and, and, of course, for sports in general. Now, is the DFA continue to facilitate the participation of our various teams in regional tournaments uh, despite COVID-19? And what systems have you at the DFA put in place to keep your players safe during training and preparation? Well, yes. Uh, we have registered for most of the tournaments that FIFA and CONCACAF and CFU have initiated. Mm -hmm. But even during the pandemic, we have had multiple training teams and participated on tournaments. We have done the men's FIFA World Cup qualifier we participated in the CONCACAF under 20 qualifiers, and we currently 
our ladies are in preparation for the CONCACAF women's qualifiers to take place soon. That's something next week in Guyana. And soon in June, we will have our CONCACAF Men's Nation Cup, the second edition, and we will definitely participate in, in that. On the part of protecting our players, we have continued to follow the necessary health protocol and have provided the necessary resources to do so during our training um, sessions. So, so everything we have to do to make sure that uh, we are not contacted with COVID-19, we follow these protocols. Okay. Now, now tell us about the plans you have, you, you have developed for the safe resumption of football. And are you getting positive feedback from clubs and individuals, individual players, about some of the safety measures you plan to implement? Well, the plans that we have are in line with the existing state protocol. We will implement measures to promote physical distancing. We will ensure that the necessary sanitization measures are put in place and ensure that there are signage around the games venue that encourage the approved COVID-19 behavior guidelines. Into, well, we had a recent meeting with our club recently. We, we mentioned our continued adherence to the state protocol to them, uh, to follow the necessary protocol. And as an association, we encourage vaccination. Our executive members are all vaccinated. At this opportunity now, at present, we have our team in training and all the players and the coaching staff are vaccinated. That's good news. I, I mean, um, I want to commend you and, and commend the executive for, the, for this effort. It's important. Now, Peter, of course you've heard uh, that government is considering the resumption of sporting activity within set guidelines and protocols. How is the Basketball Association preparing uh, for this eventuality? Um, so what we, the two things is, the first one, um, we have started uh, conversations with our body. So we have um, a group chat with representation from the various teams. And we have had many discussions around the topic of vaccinations and also what the what persons would like to see as how what what is a, a acceptable but yet safe just to get the feed the, the sense um, from from our body and then what we would do is take that feedback so when we have the retreat we would put together our um, our plan for for the resumption of sports when that comes through no you, you mentioned vaccination uh, yes what is the general view uh, among your executive and membership in respect to vaccination and and is this something they will be willing to consider in order to safely resume play so what we have discussed um, most of our executive is fully vaccinated um, but there are persons with obviously sometimes with conflicting uh, well not conflicting but opposing views on the vaccination so knowing that the vaccine does provide protection for the individual um, what we want to, one of the things that we're exploring is having our athletes and even um, the, 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 organizing, the organizing staff do medicals with the, so that the doctors can tell us what state each individual is. And if, if the doctor indicates that there are underlying conditions that may put someone at an increased risk, then we would have to be responsible and not expose them to that additional risk unless if they, for sure they... Um, do explore the vaccination so that they are at additional protection. Okay, good. Now, Liam, how mm. is the DCA uh, preparing to return to group play? And, and what measures are you taking within your association to promote a safe return? Uh, for example, is the DCA uh, requiring its officials and players uh, to get vaccinated? So it's um, one of the things that we have we have done as the association. We had um, a Zoom consultation, which was um, spared by the National Vaccination Unit, with um, Dr. Kivian Burnett um, was the lead presenter, where he was presenting on the importance of vaccines and so on. We also are encouraging heavy persons to be vaccinated, and I just want to join Mr. Etienne in saying that the entire executive of the cricket association is vaccinated also some of us have received booster shots so we are basically taking the lead from the, the executive point of view 
We have also been trying to reach out to teams to, to understand their vaccination status um, in terms of how many persons are because one of the things that we 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 understand that most of our players when they have when they are selected to travel, they, they must be vaccinated. So we are basically trying to put our players in the position that if they are selected for travel, that they are ready to ready for play and they are not um, hindered by their vaccination status. So we are also um, we wrote to the, the Ministry of Sports and um, unfortunately a meeting which was scheduled last week Wednesday was not able to take place because of um, some, some COVID cases. So we're hoping that in the near future that that meeting could, could come along where we have a proposal that we have written to the government that we'd like to discuss because there are a few competitions that the DCA would be required to, to hold in the, in the coming months. So we'd really like to have that discussion with the, the government so that we, we can just educate the body as to where we are, what is the government's proposal and what is needed as a collective so that we can have a secret report. Yeah, thank you. Now, gentlemen, as we wind down our discussion, I, I want to look ahead uh, to how we can work together uh, to improve uh, the sporting sector in our country. Now, Liam, how can your organization, the DCA, uh, play a bigger role in advancing the development of sports? Uh, of course, working collaboratively with the sports division, the Ministry of Sports. Yeah, I think that the, the, the collaboration is very important. Also, having a channel of communication that um, stakeholders can have an open line with the, the executives so that everybody's on the same page. And also, not just thinking solely of cricket, but having that communication with other associations as we speak to the president of the football association, the basketball president. You know, with Zoom, you always have some challenges. Um, Peter? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Liam, you're done, right? Well, I, I, I got yeah. unstable connection. But... Yeah. OK. Now, now, Peter, government continues to invest in, in the development of sporting facilities around the island. And, and that, that certainly will continue, uh, including facilities for basketball. How do you, how do you see us joining forces uh, to further advance the interests of basketballers and other sportsmen on island? Yes, um, so I do know that there's a plan to cover at least, I believe, seven courts around the island. And I believe that is the number one um, hindrance for the development of sport in Dominica because uh, we do experience uh, lots of rain around the, around the calendar year. So being able to have an, uh, facilities that are covered we then can better plan our activities and develop activities. Now, though the question was geared towards basketball, I would just like to agree with both Liam and even um, the Honorable Lauren Banish Roberts earlier, who mentioned that there needs to be collaboration between the various sports because I believe that we could deduplicate efforts and make a more and have a more sustainable approach where, whereby we can, as long as we have the structure and we coordinate properly that this is something that we that can benefit all sports and not just basketball. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Now, Glenn, I, I want to thank the DFA for the contribution uh, made last year to the rehabilitation of the Geneva playing field. Uh, but how can we collaborate even more closely to advance the sport of football in Dominica? Yeah, thank you, Honorable Prime Minister. Um, as we speak, we have an ongoing project at the Point Michel playing field, which is a much bigger project than maybe what happened in Grand Bay. But I believe that greater communication and collaboration is key. We must be able to work together and, as the old saying say, scratch each other's back. <laughs> the, the, the cooperation of the state is required when we need approvals, documentations, and facilities to promote um, the play, the play of football and all like all other sports. The DFA's ability to get access to our schools is equally important since we want to develop football from the young age, which is the, the, the grassroots. And not just for, it's there for both boys and girls. That way we can reach them where they are already and get them more interested in the game. The old people who say a sporting nation 
is a healthier and more productive nation. And the earlier our youths are engaged in, in participating in sports, it's better for us and our, our country. I just want to say to you that, you know, we've left enough land for you um, and for the folks in Point Michel for the expansion of the playing field. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure you, you, you're happy to hear that. A any final words for us, Sam Glenn? Yeah, well, we want to start aggressively on, on um, the Point Michel playing field. Um, and like both um, Liam and Peter said before, it's a collaboration of all sports because I think if we develop the Point Michel playing field, which is a closer venue to the Windsor Park Sports Stadium, and it's not too far out of the Rosso venue. So that will help our, our sports. Um, so I want to, um, the earlier we can start on, on this would, would help um, our football. What I also want to make mention of, Honorable Prime Minister, is um, our athletes, you know, I mean, too many times maybe um, when they are in national training, they, they, they lost wages, and I think, um, we want to work closely with government that um, that does not really happen to our athletes, that they maybe are compensated, so they do lose their, their wages when they um, represent um, Dominica. Well, I'm hoping that with the, obviously, we, we are putting systems in place, and um, folks like yourselves, administrators, will be represented on the committee to um, review the existing draft um, uh, sports policy uh, with, with the view of setting up the sports council. And also looking at the legislation, repealing the existing legislation and bringing new legislation, modern legislation. So I'm hoping all of these issues can be included in the legislation. And of course, athletes can feel much more confused. Uh, um, Peter Ricketts, Liam Sebastian, um, Glenn Aitin, uh, Ambassador Lauren Banish Roberts, and of course, our sports coordinator, Trevor Schillingford, for joining us. There's so much more that we could speak about. Um, sports really is uh, an exciting. Um, thing, well, particularly uh, during the pandemic, and certainly it, it speaks well for the future of, of sports and to have very um, conscientious and, and committed and dedicated people at the helm of the various sporting organizations is very important, and we have that now. And so it's an opportunity for us to work together as all stakeholders to the advancement of sports. And, and let, us, let us bring together all of the ideas and the suggestions on, on what are the 10 important things we need to do to build sports in Dominica. Let us go forth and to serve our country and to serve our God. Um, you know, we are still in the pandemic period. Um, we still have many challenges. But the most important thing, we have life, and we must thank God for that. Let us always see the glass half full rather than half empty, because we have to always, always sh show gratitude for that which we have. And sometimes we forget what we have, and we're looking for things we don't have. So let us first appreciate what we have and see how we can build on this. Thank you very much, and of course, thank you for joining me again on Anupali. Good night.